Ooh, that looks tasty. Welcome folks, today the Hungry Gamer is back with another how to play video and today we are learning how to play Elements of the Gods designed by J Vowels and published by Side Room Games. Now if you are interested in what my thoughts on this game are then you can check out my preview video and there's a link to that down in the description. But Let's jump in and talk about how this game is played. In a nutshell, this is a game where each player is a young god striving for dominance of the land. And what you're going to be doing throughout the game is you're going to be using the five elements, being wind, fire, water, earth, and death, to influence the people in the land to build gardens, build monuments that honor you. Now, what you see here is you see pieces for a two-player game. The game does play up to five, but for this how to play video, I will only be using two sets of game pieces in order to demonstrate. In this case, obviously I have yellow and blue. However, there's also white, pink, and brown. And let's talk about what it is that you're seeing down here. We have five monuments for each player. We have a score marker for each player. We have our first player marker. We have our five different elements. We have garden tiles, garden cards, monument cards, and divinity cards. And of course, I'll explain what all of those do in just a bit. In addition to that, we have a bag full of meeples, as you can see there, and they come in four different colors. You have green, you have purple, red, and gray. The gray are stonemasons, the red are zealots, the purple are mystics, and the green are gardeners. And then finally, each player gets a player aid with what each of the elements do. And again, I will explain all that in just a little bit. And the last thing before I get started is I do need to point out that everything here is still a prototype. These are 3D printed components and generic components. And so everything here will likely look different. And it's also possible there may be some design changes that happen as well. In which case, do make sure you've turned on your Klingon subtitles, because if there are any changes, that is where you will find those changes. So the first thing that you need to do is give each player all of their pieces. So they will take all of their monuments, and then each player will place their scoring token on the zero at the top left corner of the board, which you can see right up here. Once that is done, you put your five elements off to the side of the board within reach of everybody. Then you will take one guard and place it in each corner of the board. Now, I should say that in a two-player game, you actually play with only a 7x7 seven seven grid, and in a three-player game, you actually use the reverse side of this board, which is a slightly different size. But for now, we will set up for the two-player game, like so. Next, you go through, and you're going to place two meeples on each garden space that's already out on the board. And these are drawn randomly from the back. And once that is done, you'll then you're going to fill up every square inside of those four gardens with two meeples. However, you will not fill in the rows directly between the two gardens. So your final setup will look like this. Then once you have your board set up, the next thing you do is you give each player five cards. They'll receive two garden cards, two monument cards, and a single divinity card. Once that is done, the next thing that you'll do is you will set up the end game scoring objectives. And to do that, you will reveal cards from the Divinity deck until you have one of each kind of end game scoring condition. And I'll show you what that looks like right now. And for the purposes of this, the top part of the Divinity card do not matter. It's only the bottom portion. The easiest way to make sure that you have one of each kind is you're looking for the number on the left. One of them is worth three, another's worth two, and the other's worth one. And what these mean is, the three is for every meeple of that specific color in your afterlife, and that'll make sense later on in this video, you'll gain three points. For this one here, you'll gain two points for every meeple of that color in a garden next to one of your monuments. And then the last one here is, you will gain one point for every meeple of that color next to one of your monuments. Then you'll take these cards and set them next to the game board like so. Once that is done, you determine who's going to be going first. In this case, whichever player has most recently performed a miracle, takes the first player marker and sets that by their player board. Once that's done, you are ready to begin the game. The game will be played in alternating turns within consecutive rounds, and the game is going to end when a single player has played their fifth divinity card from their hand. And again, I will explain how that's done over the course of the game. Just keep in mind the game will end at the conclusion of a round 
in which any player has played their fifth Divinity card from their hand. At the conclusion of that round, you will do all of your in-game scoring, which again I will talk about a little bit later, and whoever has the most points will be the winner. Now, let's talk about how a round works. Each player on their turn will get to play one of these five elements out onto the board. Each element does something slightly different. The round is over when all five elements have been played. Then when that's done, you pass the first player marker to the left or the right, depending on the player count, and then you simply begin the round again. So let's talk about what you do on your turn in a round. Your turn is relatively simple. All you are going to do is you are going to select one of the five elements, and you are going to play it somewhere on the board. By placing an element, it will affect the meeples on the board in some way or another, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Once that is done, you will either play one card from your hand, or you will discard one or more cards from your hand. Then you will draw your hand back up to five cards, selecting cards from any of the three draw decks, whether those be divinity cards, monument cards, or garden cards. Now let's talk about how the elements work. The first thing to know is that you can never place an element on any square that has a garden, a monument, or another element. I will say there is an exception to that for the earth element, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's start with wind. When you place wind, the wind is going to blow in a direction of your choice, and it's going to affect a nine square box directly in one direction away from the wind. In this case, the wind will be blowing this way. When you place it, you get to choose a single color of worshiper, i.e. meeple, and they are the ones that will be affected. So in this case, let us assume that I decided to affect red. Every red meeple would be blown one square in that direction. And so at the end of this turn, when the wind blows, if I chose to affect the red meeples, it would look like this. As you can see, all the red meeples moved, the other colored meeples were not affected. Then that player would get to play a card, and then the next player would get to place an element. I will note that the element stays on the board, and they are not picked up until the end of the round. Next, let's talk about how water works. When you place water, you place it on a square, and again, you choose a single colored meeple. And again, just for the sake of argument, we will say that I am choosing red. Every single red meeple in the eight squares around the water element will get drawn into the element. So if I chose red at the end of the turn, it would look like this. And again, I would leave the water there. Next, we'll talk about fire. So if I were to say place it right here, and I selected gray as my color, every gray meeple in all of the squares surrounding would move away from the fire one space. So again, if I place it here, the end result would look like this. It is also important to note that all meeples of your chosen color in the same space with the fire element are moved away one square as well, though the player placing the fire will get to choose where it is that they move. Next, we will talk about death. And for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to pool some of these more of these meeples together in a single square to illustrate how it works. When you place death in a square, every single worshiper in that square immediately is removed from the board and returned to the back, with the exception of two meeples. You will get to select two of them, and you'll place them in what is known as your afterlife. And if you recall, one of the in-game scoring conditions I talked about was having meeples of a certain color in your afterlife at the end of the game. So for this example, knowing that gray meeples in the afterlife are worth three points for me, I would take these two and put them next to my player board in my afterlife, and these other meeples here would go back into the meeple bag to be drawn again at a later time. The last element is Earth. And Earth does break one of the rules of placing elements. Earth is allowed to be placed into a garden space if you so choose. When you place Earth into a garden space, you are going to Earth or add five new meeples to that square. However, before you go into the bag and draw, you are allowed to pull meeples out of your afterlife and reincarnate them instead. So if you recall, my death had given me two stonemasons, which I put in my afterlife. If I wanted, I could take one or two of these and place them here in this square to begin the turn. Then I could go and draw three more meeples from the bag and place them in the square as well. And as you can see, I now have a very full garden with the earth element. At the end of the round, after all elements have been played, they will all be removed from the board, the first player marker is passed, and the next round begins. Yeah. However, I also said every turn you have the option of 
playing a card or discarding cards. So let's talk about how you actually play cards in this game. There are three things that you are able to do. You can fulfill divinity cards, and during gameplay, you are dealing with the top portion of this card, not the bottom. The bottom portion only comes into effect at the end of the game. You can play new gardens, or you can build new monuments. So first, let's talk about monument cards. Each monument card is very simple. It allows you to place a monument onto a square that has at least that minimal amount of meeples in that color pattern. So, for example, for this one right here, if I was blue and there was a stonemason and a mystic in the same square, I could then place a monument there. When you place a monument in the square, there are a couple rules that you have to follow. You may not place your monument on a square that has a garden or obviously on a square that already has another monument. In addition to that, you may not place a monument on any square that is orthogonally adjacent to another monument. However, being diagonally adjacent is not a problem and is perfectly acceptable. So in this case, I could place my monument here. I would then take all of the worshippers on that square and I would move all of them to another square that is adjacent to where I've placed the monument. I will also note that had there been an element on that space, placing the monument is allowed and the element just simply moves to another space along with the worshippers. Each different monument card has a different color combination of meeples. I will also note that the square does not have to have only two meeples there, as long as it has a minimum of one of each of the meeples on the card, that is acceptable. I will also note that building a monument next to a garden will earn you five points. Garden cards are slightly more complicated. You are only able to place a garden diagonally adjacent to a monument. Assuming that condition is met, for example, if I had a green and a gray meeple right there, then you are able to take a garden and place it underneath the two meeples that are there, and you have now built a garden. When you have built a garden, you will immediately score five points for every monument either diagonally adjacent or orthogonally adjacent to that garden. And that includes both your own monuments and it includes other players' monuments as well. So in this case, placing a garden there would get blue 10 points and yellow 5 points. And I'll also say that having an element in the space does not prevent you from placing a garden. And finally, we'll talk about how you play your divinity cards. The first one we'll start with is the are the smite cards. The smite cards are only playable if you are using the death element. And if, by playing the death element, you killed off worshippers that were the same in number and color as on the card, in this case, you would have had to kill four of the same color worshiper, then you can then immediately score the points on the card playing one of the divinity cards out next to your player board. The smite cards will either tell you that you are looking for a certain number of the same color worshiper or a certain number of any color worshiper. The other type of divinity card that you can play is a ritual. To complete a ritual, you simply have to have the setup shown on the card. So in this case, you have to have two of your monuments that are diagonally adjacent to the same garden. And on that garden, there must be both a purple and a red meeple. I will point out that in this case, I could not play this card because neither blue nor yellow controls both of these monuments. However, if this was the situation, then blue could score this card, immediately gaining 18 points, and then placing this card next to your player board as one of their five played divinity cards. I will also note that ritual cards require the sacrifice of a single zealot. Zealots are always red, and they go into your afterlife at the conclusion of playing that card. It is also worth pointing out that there are multiple kinds of ritual cards that you can accomplish, and they will change up the orientation of what you need. In this case, you would simply have to have two monuments in this orientation next to any square that had a red and a purple meeple on it. I will note that in this case, even though it does not show a garden, it is possible to have a garden or not have a garden on that space. And that is actually the core of how the game is played. As you're playing through the rounds, you'll be earning points by having gardens and monuments being adjacent or orthogonally adjacent to each other. In addition, you'll be earning points by playing your divinity cards from your hand. However, you're also going to get points at the end of the game. The first thing that's scored at the end of the game is whichever player was the first one to play all five of their divinity cards will receive a bonus of 20 points. Any other player that manages to play their fifth divinity card on that final round will earn an additional 15 points. Then you go through and you look at the end game scoring cards. And as a reminder, you'll be earning one point for every of a certain colored worshiper next to a monument, two points for every 
instance of having a certain color worshiper in a garden next to a monument, and you'll be earning three points for every of a certain color worshiper in your afterlife. However, that is not all. The end game is triggered by playing your fifth divinity card. However, that does not mean that you can't have other divinity cards in your hand. Every divinity card that's in your hand at the end of the game also is used as end game scoring, and then you'll be able to take the bottom of each of those cards and score those as well. After all that's done, whoever has the most points is the winner and is the most powerful new god. And it is worth just noting that you are only scoring the end game scoring on divinity cards in your own hand. The divinity cards in other players' hand will be scored by them, and you do not get to score any of the bottom of the card bonuses on divinity cards that you played during the game. There is also a solo mode that you can play, but I will leave you to check that out on your own in the rulebook. And if you're looking for video content on that, Michael Kelly at One Stop Co-op Shop does have a solo play video, which you can check out as well. So there you have it, folks. That's how to play Elements of the Gods from Side Room Games. I hope you found this video useful. As always, if you have any comments, I'd love to know them. Please leave them down below. As a reminder, you can check out my preview video through a link in the description. And additionally, down there, you'll find out how to get more information on how to get your own copy of Elements of the Gods. As always, if you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.